The Confederate Rebellion, a solitaire game of the American Civil War. This game is a revamped version of a game that came out a couple of years ago. The original one was called ACW Solitaire and now we have a cleaned up, streamlined version with different, a couple of different things and more clarifications. It is a solitaire game just like the original was with optional rules to play it, um, two players and it is a game that is very ambitious because its goal is to represent the American Civil War in its entirety, the whole thing, in a game that is playable in under two hours that has less than 10 pages of rules that has fluid, simple, streamlined gameplay. So very ambitious and I have to tell you, it works. This is a game that achieves that really not so easy goal. So you, the player, will control forces of the Union and the AI of the system will control forces controlled by the, uh, by the Confederate rebels and you will need to use a mix of battlefield actions, sea action, river action and in general economic action to be able to uh, stop the Confederates. The game may last until uh, until 1865 in ter terms of game turns that is 20 turns you lose the game if the Confederates take control of Washington that makes sense if they take control of four areas so generally controlled by the Union or if you have not won the game by the 20th turn each turn the Confederates receive a number of build points that they use to, well, build new stuff. And you can affect the number of build points by doing different things. And that is also your goal because you win the game by reducing the number of build points that the Confederate players receive in a turn to zero. If they get zero points in a turn, you win the game. What you see here is the uh, situation at setup. So we have uh, uh, Union forces in the north and rebel forces in the south. What a surprise. Actually, something that I also should mention is that the game is available by White Dog Games, so that is the publisher, and they have a professionally printed version or they have the print and play version. And what I'm showing you here is the print and play version. So I just bought the file, then I made my own copy, printed it, I mounted the counters so they're double sided on, uh, on cardboard from a cereal box. Very simple to build. And in these days of social distancing, uh, it's great to have the option not just to have solitaire games, so you don't have to have game night, but also games that you can just build in your house without having to leave the house. <clears throat> now, the uh, the game is pretty simple, talking about the units that you see here on the board, uh, maybe close up to see those battles. We have armies that are of course the basic fighting force. What matters really is that the indication that that is an army plus the number that you see here. These numbers indicate the strength points of the armies and you can give change freely. So if I add two armies there, I can add a two there or exchange a two and a one for a three. Just giving change freely. Not, <clears throat> not a difficult concept. We have forts. Uh, they count as a unit when you calculate how much strength, combat strength a side has in that place. Also, when there is a fight, the side that controls the fort, the defender that is defending in a fort does not have to retreat. And in fact, if the attacker doesn't manage to destroy the fort, which is the last piece to be destroyed, the attacker has to go back to where they came from. So a lot of advantages. We have the generals that are necessary to move armies in enemy territory. You can move armies by themselves in areas that you control, but not in enemy territories. To attack an opponent, you need to move armies together with a general. They also have a number here, which is a modifier that is used in several functions, in particular to indicate how well they perform in combat, and for the confederate generals also what they do is used to determine their actions. Gunboats, <clears throat> we have gunboats here, they go on the river of course, again they are fungible in terms of adding strength points, removing strength points, and you can use them to attack other gunboats like in this case but also to transport units. 
The uh, Union player, that would be you, also has fleets. The fleets are naval units that, uh, that stay in the ocean and they stay in these two boxes here, a tra the transfer box and the blockade box. The number <clears throat> of fleets that you have in a transport box it tells you how many land units you can move from port to port and actually when you're moving uh, navally from port to port you can enter an enemy controlled area without a general that is the only exception to the rule that I explained earlier fleets can also be in the blockade box and actually that is one of the ways in which you deny build points to the opponent. One of the build points that the confederate side receives is if they roll a die, a six-sided die, and they roll not higher than the current number of uh, fleets in the blockade box. So I have a three there when I roll for that build point if the union side rolls one to three they don't get the build point four to six they do get the build point. If I have six units in the blockade box then I'm absolutely sure that they are not gonna get that build point. Well maybe since we are to it we can talk about those and the other build points that they get. The um, Confederates get a build point if they, they have not lost control of the Mississippi entirely. So that means if the Union does not control these river areas and the associated land areas, they also receive a build point if they control Richmond or Atlanta. That means that to deny that you need to eliminate both. And then also you have a, um, uh, what else? Oh yeah, and also you have a die roll which must be greater than the number of rebel port regions occupied by Union units. So you also want to occupy these regions. They roll a die. They do not roll greater than the number of regions you're occupying. Then they don't get that point. So I'm that also tells you what you need to do to win the game. You need to occupy the ports, you need to control the Mississippi, you need to place units in the blockade, you need to take Richmond and, and Atlanta, and you need to do all of that without losing Washington. After the first couple of turns, it's not that easy for them, unless they have an early breakthrough, to take control of four regions, that victory condition. It's important it's there, otherwise you would play unrealistically. But really, you need to achieve those four objectives, not lose Washington. So the point is really that you have a lot of stuff to do and the enemies are not super strong. But again, they they can slow you down and you have a really busy schedule here. Each turn is divided into a very simple, very intuitive sequence of play. First you have a union build phase in which the union player always receives five build points. They can be used to build to build armies, uh, as simple as that, we mentioned that factor there. They can be used to build forts, uh, to build gunboats, again at, this, at the cost of one build point per army or per gunboat or per fort. Generals, you can add a new general for the cost of a build point. You draw randomly the general that you get and sometimes you get grant and some of the times you don't get anybody, somebody nearly as good as them. You can also spend, um, you can also as a free action sack a general and then you can spend a build point to replace the general with a randomly drawn one and replacing McClellan with Grant is a really lucky thing. So first the Union player <clears throat> will build units. Again, you can also build gunboats, you can build fleet, fleets. Then the Union player gets to move unions, uni <laughs> units. The fleets can move from one box to the other, uh, simple as that, from blockade to transport and vice versa. Gunboats can move along the Mississippi River, but they have to stop if they enter an area with a fort or with an enemy gunboat. The armies can move up to two spaces as long as within friendly controlled territories. If they have a general, then they can enter an area controlled by the enemy, but they can also 
only move one movement point, only one area, in case you're entering areas that are not friendly. And that's pretty much for the movement phase. After the movement phase, you resolve combat in all areas that contain units belonging to both players. The same case, there's that. Actually, something about movement. You may have really difficult landings because during movement, you can also move your units across the river, pretty much using the gunboats like, like, like bridges, really, because you can move through areas that have gunboats in them. And like so, in which case say you move there and then you enter there and then you resolve combat as normal. Of course, you will need a general to do that, but just to show movement. However, if you're entering an area that, if you're trying to enter an area that has a fort, then you first need to have combat with the fort and any unit that may, that may occupy the fort. And you need to win. During that combat during that combat to see if you're able to land you resolve a random combat the attacker takes damage the defender does not take damage and you're simply looking for a for a result that has the keyword victory in which case then you land it and then you can resolve land combat as normal so <clears throat> whichever way you got there now you have to resolve the combat because there are units of the Union and of the Confederates in the same space. It's pretty simple. Basically, you will roll a die, you will apply modifiers, and then you read the combat result table and see what happens. The modifiers are based, for the most part, on combat odds. So inferiority or superiority of the attacker, what, one? 3 to 1, 1 to 3, and so on and so forth. Superiority, but not higher than 1 to 1. Superiority to 2 to 1, etc, etc. Um, and these are modifiers that will be applied to the die roll. Minus 1 for the attacker, if the uh, defender has a 4 there. The general rating, so this would be Lee adds plus 3 in attack and subtracts minus 3 when defending uh, Grant has a 2, again, plus 2 in attack, minus 2 in defense. So you total all of the possible modifiers, you roll a d6. So remember, you are the attacker because we are resolving Union combat phase. And you apply the result. All the losses, lose half, lose a third, are rounded up. So that can be pretty bloody. As it says, some of those on top of just inflicting losses and or retreats also had the victory keyword which is used for uh, opposed landing in areas that have forts. After that, after you resolve that, then you simply have the, um, the confederate turn which of course is automatized. First you roll dice and you determine how many bill points the confederates get and then you roll a die to see how they spend them. They may spend them based on the die roll to uh, get new armies. Uh, then the new armies may go to generals. Uh, first, a general that does not have an army or a fort gets one. If they all have at least some forces behind them, then uh, Lee gets one first, then Bragg gets one, and again Smith, then G Smith gets one. That's if you roll one to three. If you roll uh, four to five, then an army enters a random region. It's placed in a random region using this table here. If you roll a six, <clears throat> then you roll again to determine if the Confederates get a fort or get a gunboat or the Union player must remove a gunboat or a fort. After they get the new stuff, so you roll a die on this one for each build point that they receive. After that, they move, and for each general, you roll a die, you add their uh, leadership rating, and then based on the result, they may just sit where they are, they may move trying to attack enemy units only if they are not dangerously numbered, or they may just go, if they're all very high and or they have a high rating, they may just go and attack the opponent um, in an adjacent area. Anyways, even if that's not a great idea, even if they are outnumbered. 
This is the idea because after the, of course, after the rebels move, they may trigger combat. Lee most likely will trigger combat. The guy just can't stand still. He just keeps harassing this area the entire game. <clears throat> and that's the idea. During your phase, you build your own forces, then you move and resolve combat, then the rebels build forces, move and resolve combat, and it's as simple as that, really. Continue like this until either you're able to eliminate all build points of the opponent, or the opponents are able to win one way they would do so if, as if turn 20 arrives and you haven't won the game yet. This is a really pleasant game. I really enjoyed it. Maybe for some of you it will be too abstract, too too generic, but actually to me it it, it really got the job done of giving me on giving me a nice if general impression of the entire event. The essentials are there really. Sure they're painted with wide brush strokes but you can definitely see the general events, the main dynamics. You can see how the Union is defending on land mainly, at least at the beginning, but mainly also uh, while well, struggling to win outside of the battlefield from the economic point of view with the blockades, with controlling um, the lines of communication, so the logistics and the economic elements are again are there. As simple as putting a fleet in a box but that element is there. And at the same time when you then look at the battlefield you do have the personalities of the generals, you do have the problem of sacking generals and you sack too many of them because you're hoping for the good one and then well you have depleted your armies in other ways because the number of possible generals that you get as a union player is limited. So it's there. It's a game about the American Civil War seen in general terms but the theme to me is there. They're just couple of bits of chrome here and there then make the game feel pretty historical but again to me the historical element is mainly in the general dynamics. From the point of view of gameplay then well the gameplay is entertaining and it's fun which is also super important because uh, you have so many things that you can do but many more that you will want to do. Uh, five Build points when you start building stuff seem like a lot and then you realize of course that there are nearly as many as you like to have. You cannot do everything that you want to do every turn so you have to prioritize and that means that from game to game you have great replay value because you can emphasize different areas of the map, different activities. You have to respond to different things so yeah, it's great to get the blockade out early on so they start losing build points from early on but then maybe you're neglecting land defense as in Lee's always there harassing you, the guy never sleeps, that's what it looks like in the game. And so uh, you always have to react to what the opponents are doing and then find different ways of getting your priorities straight, which again makes for interesting gameplay. And you cannot do everything every turn, but you will be able to do everything if you are a little bit lucky, you're not too incompetent, and you can survive for long enough. So that makes for gameplay that is interesting, that is tense, that has variety. Because again, it feels like, okay, I'm, I'm blocking this, I'm, I don't feel like Washington is all that in danger anymore right now. I feel the, the, the more or less we are going down towards the Mississippi, but then you realize you only have a couple of turns to take Atlanta and Richmond or to complete something else, to block the ports. So again, there is tension, there is progression, there is an arc. All these things really work well together. And they are all the more remarkable when you think that you're in a game that has such a simple set of rules that shows you such, such an event of such magnitude in two hours or less. And so that's also interesting. My worry was that uh, since you only have a limited number of things that you can do and the opponents also only do a limited number of things that the game could feel repetitive but again with the fact that you can spend build points and actions of different things every time I didn't find that to be a problem at all. I found myself captivated by the game and so I'm definitely recommending it to well um, almost everybody out there really. Season War Gamers, maybe it's gonna be a little bit on the light side for you, but there's nothing wrong in taking a break from some of your monster games. But another advantage is that you could pay it, of course, cooperative 
with the young aspiring war gamers that you have at home with your children uh, that you're stuck with in these weird days of spring 2020 or quarantine and so now you can play with them you play cooperatively because you work together to uh, to make decisions and it's a game that you can play with pretty young war gamers or aspiring war gamers and I think you won't have any problem. You can play with casual war gamers, uh, with casual gamers, with almost everybody because the rules are very simple and also intuitive. Maybe a river landing and river assaults, uh, you have to reread the rules two times or three times maybe, but that's pretty much the only passage that that's at least got me a little bit uh, confused at the beginning. Uh, but then I... I know the rules of for the people and river landings there are well a whole lot of thing but a lot of things are much simpler than for the people which is a great game but of course one of those big monsters that almost are more more of a lifestyle than a game but the confederate rebellion is a game it is a fun game you can play it as a game you don't have to embrace a whole new lifestyle to play it it is simple it is fun you can build it uh, from a print and play, which is also part of the fun. So in general, very high endorsement for uh, the Confederate Rebellion from me.